Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. It is good to be here, and I look forward to a informative share. Some of the ideas that you're going to hear tonight, you might have heard before. Some of the ideas you haven't. I encourage you to come to this shear with a broad mind. I know that I can't convince anybody something that um, that I can't convince, but at the same time, I hope that some of the ideas we share tonight will reframe at least some perspectives. So let me start with the question that we launched the shear about, and that is, did the Sinai happen? It's not a simple question to answer. The easy answer as a rabbi is to say, yes, of course Sinai happened. The problem with that answer is prove it. If you've been to the last few shirim that we do over here, what we're trying to do is take things from an intellectual, straight, honest level and unpack it. So prove it. Can I prove that Sinai happened? So let me tell you why I can't prove it, and then I'll tell you how I will prove it. The one way I cannot prove it is archeologically. There are certain things that happened in Judaism's history that if I was an archeologist, or if I at least showed you some archeology, span I would be able to show you something happened. For example, the patriarchs and matriarchs, did they exist? Well, we could go into the cave of Machpelah, which is the big building that they're actually doing renovations right now in the city of Hebron, Hebron. And we could go down into the tombs, because when you go upstairs, you just see things that were built by the Muslim rulers about a thousand years ago, but you're not seeing the graves. We could go inside, in theory, dig down, and we will find and discover the graves of the patriarchs and matriarchs. Okay, you might say that we won't discover it, but ultimately, According to tradition, we know the place where it's pointed and people at least over the thousands of years since have claimed to have seen the actual graves of the patriarchs and matriarchs. The temple. If you go to the Temple Mount, although the Muslim Waqf is trying to destroy a lot of the evidence that's there, there's no question that we have solid evidence that on the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago and two and a half thousand years ago, a temple stood that was called the Jewish Temple. But if I asked you, okay, Rabbi, prove me Sinai happened. Where is Sinai? Where is Mount Sinai? I can't tell you. There are, in today's modern debate, three places that are argued as the place where Sinai could have happened. And they're all across the map. One is in the Sinai Desert and two are across Saudi Arabia. So ultimately, nobody actually knows where the mountain is. What they're trying to do is hypothesis based on the fact that the Torah tells us the Jews travel from Egypt to Israel on this route, trying to take the ancient map and place it on the modern map, their hope is that they'll be able to convince you that this is the place that happened, but ultimately they cannot do it absolutely. There's no way they can actually do it in an absolute way. So where does that leave you? That leaves you with the problem Sinai has no physical evidence. So the only evidence you're going to be able to find now is either writings of the time or tradition that goes back generations without break. But you cannot have the science of tangible things in front of you, like the temple and other issues. Now, the, it's interesting because Judaism is a mixture of stuff that you can prove scientifically through archaeology and stuff that you can't. For example, the Jews in Egypt. So although we showed a movie in Shul two years ago called Patterns of Evidence, ultimately that's based on you accept certain assumptions that the movie is trying to offer. But if you're going with the assumptions that the world has uh, treats Egyptian history, you will not be able to find evidence that the Jews lived in Egypt in the time that we claim they did. Unless you change history like the movie does, they, they try to move it up a few hundred years. And then they find evidence. The splitting of the sea. If I want to show you evidence, I can't. We dig down in the sea. Have we found any wheels or anything? Not really. 
So there are certain things that are fundamental to the Jewish religion that archaeologically you have a problem with. Honestly, you have a problem with the whole story of Egypt, the whole story of the Exodus, the whole story of the Jews in the desert, because we have no traceable um, archaeology to prove that three million people lived in the desert for an extended amount of time, and the giving of the Torah, which happened in the desert. The only thing you have is once the Jews arrive in Israel, you start having various stones, etc., showing that the Jews did arrive to Israel at a certain stage. So the whole part of Jewish formation, the story where the Jews become a nation from the Exodus till the arrival in Israel, archaeologically has no truth, at least as of yet. We might find it one day, as of now we haven't found it. So that's why I'll start, I said, I'll start off this year with the proof that I cannot bring. I cannot bring archaeological proof that Sinai happened. So then why, as a Jew, do I believe it? Or is it one of the principles of faith that I have to believe? So here's where things get tricky. I'm going to introduce you to two groups that caused huge havoc in Jewish history at different eras and show you an interesting pattern that both those eras had. There were two groups that literally destroyed the Jewish community at the time, that, and I'm talking about Jews destroying Jews. The first group happened at about the time that Christianity takes off, or at least a little before that, during the time of JC. There was a group of people called Sidukim. You could Google this after the shear. It's, it's not only Jewish legend, it's, it's fact. We actually have the, uh, many proofs of it. In English, they're called the Sadducees, with a double D. The Sadducees, S-A-D-D-U-C-E-E-S. The Sadducees. They were extremely dominant in the Second Temple era of the Jewish history. When Second Temple, just to give you context, the Second Temple was destroyed in the year 70, common era. We're now in the year 2020, so that's exactly 1950 years ago. And for the 400 years before that, the Second Temple stood. So we're talking about just at the beginning of Common Era and the few hundred years BCE, just before Common Era started. Now, the Jews are living in Israel, they have a, second, they have a temple. During that time is when the Hanukkah story happens. And a group of people developed, and their leader was a name, a guy by the name of Tzadok. Tzadok. That, interesting, it's very similar to the word Tzadik, but his name was Tzadok. That's why they're called Sadducees, as in Sadukim. They followed the leader named Tzadok. What was Tzadok's argument? He had a very interesting argument. He felt that the rabbis corrupted Judaism. Ever since the rabbis got involved in Judaism, they corrupted it. It goes back to the share we spoke about last time, the oral law. But he said that the oral law is a farce. And therefore, he will go directly back to the literal interpretation, the literal reading of the text of the five books of Moses. And the whole religion of the Sadducees was called literalism, where they would open the text in the Torah, and what the Torah said without any commentaries, that's what they did. So, for example, if it, the Torah says that the tefillin has to be between your eyes, there it was, between your eyes. If the Torah said that on Shabbos you shouldn't light a candle, they took it literally, you have to sit in Shabbos in the dark. Now, you might call them crazies or primitives, but they were a huge part of Jewish history. So much so that they, during the Second Temple era, many of the holy priests, the Kohen Gadol, were Sadducees. Why? Because the Sadducees were very wealthy and they would pay the local governments, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans later, they would bribe them to get the position. And the Sadducees ruled over the Jewish center of life, the temple, for hundreds of years during the Second Temple era. So these guys were extremely powerful, and they were passionate to destroy what they considered the rabbinic Judaism. At the time, the, the rabbinic Judaism, they were called Pharisees or Perushim. So we, as an old Jews today, pretty much trace ourselves back to the Purushim. The Tzedukim, they lasted for hundreds of years, but not too long after the destruction of the Second Temple, 
the Sadducees fell away in history. So although they had a huge impact in many ways, even the destruction of the Second Temple, the Sadducees played a big role because there was a lot of interfighting in the Jewish community, and they played a role. After that, they fell away. I'll push you now a thousand years later to the year 900 Common Era, and a new group of people arises, this time not in the Holy Land, but in Egypt. And they are called, and they actually exist till today, they are called the Karaites, with a K. K-A-R-A-I-T-E-S, the Karaites, or in Hebrew, the Karaim, with exactly the same argument. They try to convince themselves they're a little different, but ultimately the Karaim showed up to the history with the same argument as the Sadducees. What was their argument? The argument was straightforward. The rabbis destroyed Judaism. So, because the rabbis destroyed Judaism, let's go back to the biblical text. Let's go back to the five books of Moses. And this group was so powerful, the Karaim, they, they rose just before the time of Maimonides. Maimonides spent a huge amount of his time, as did Nachmanides and many of the middle-aged sages, especially in the Sephardi countries, because Karaim was mostly a Sephardi phenomenon, not an Ashkenazi phenomenon that happened in the Sephardi countries, they spent a huge amount of effort trying to prove, disprove the Karaites' arguments. At some stage, 40% of the Jewish community in Egypt were Karaites. And it caused a huge issue because the Karaites were accepting converts based on Karaite standards. So the Orthodox Judaism didn't accept it, similar to what happens now in Reform. Orthodox Judaism does not accept a Reformed convert. It will accept a, a Jew who practices Reform, but they won't accept a wedding that's facilitated by Reform. Any ritual that's facilitated by Reform, Orthodoxy won't accept. And that's what happened then, 1,200 years ago. They weren't accepting anything that was done by the Karaites. So when there was marriage options between the, the Rabbinic Judaism and the Karaite Judaism, it caused real issues. I, I, I learned today a fascinating tidbit of history. I know that you came here to hear about Sinai, but th there's a punchline to everything I'm telling you. The, it, there were Karaites 200 years ago in Russia. There are actually Karaites in Israel today, mainly in the city of Ashdod. But there were Karaites in Russia. And what they try to do is convince the Russian government to stop government-sanctioned anti-Semitism against themselves because they claim that they weren't part of the Jewish community during the time that JC was killed. And the Russians, the Russian Orthodox Church, were holding Jews accountable for the fact that they killed JC. So the Karaites had to come up, they, they hired a guy to make up history because the Karaites were only invented somewhere in the 7th, 8th, 9th century. We don't know exactly, but definitely after the destruction of the temple and after JC, they came up with some kind of proof that when JC was killed, 2,000 years ago, the Karaites were already living in Egypt. So much so, they proved it that there's a document, you can search it on Wikipedia, there's a document where the Russian government says that from now on, state-sanctioned anti-Semitism, state-sanctioned whatever Jewish responsibility will not, no longer be put on the Karaites. Okay. Now, what do the Sadducees and the Karaites have in common? They both undermined rabbinic Judaism, but that's a share for another time, whether rabbinic Judaism is valid or not. We spoke about it at length the previous time. But they both agreed that the Torah was given at Sinai and that biblical Judaism is true. That means even the largest groups throughout history who caused the biggest breakthrough, the breakouts rather, within Judaism, and I'm not talking about reform and conservative that were only invented in the last hundred and 80 years. I'm talking about the groups that cut at the heart of Judaism over the last 3,000 years, and the two most pivotal groups were the Sadducees and the Karaites. They literally ripped tens of thousands of Jews away from rabbinic Judaism, and eventually they splintered out and they never came back and lost their history. Both of them never assumed to argue that biblical Judaism was inaccurate. And the question is why? Why, if Sinai, as I started this year, I told you that you cannot point to Sinai on the map. So if Sinai cannot be pointed on the map, why is it that the two most controversial groups within Jewish history, successfully controversial, 
never aimed to argue that Sinai didn't happen. The first time that we find within the Jewish community the doubting of Sinai is with the rising of reform and biblical criticism in the, in the 19th century, literally less than 200 years ago. Till then, it was an accepted fact throughout history for 3,000 years, it was an accepted fact that Sinai happened. Even those who broke away. I'll say more than that, Christianity. Christianity came and their argument was that there was a New Testament, but they never negated the Old Testament. What did they negate? And this is the biggest proof from all two, from all three. They came and they argued again against rabbinic Judaism. They felt that the rabbis had lost the plot and therefore they need JC to come and reinterpret the, the Old Testament with new interpretations. But Christianity, 2000 years ago, never thought to argue against the Hebrew Bible, as did the Muslims. When the Muslims came, they still considered the Bible a holy book. Why? Because all religions trace themselves back, whether accurately or not is irrelevant for this topic, they all trace themselves back to the Sinai experience. They all see the Sinai experience as a pivotal moment. And they see the Torah as the foundation of their religion if at least they moved it, they moved it a different direction, but that's the foundation. So how does something like Sinai, which has no archaeological evidence, become a fact for most of the world, for majority of history? So some people will argue that at some stage, a bunch of rabbis sat together and concocted a story that a bunch of Jews stood at the foot of a mountain, three million Jews, stood at the foot of the mountain and God talked to them. But here's the fundamental flaw with that argument. You cannot argue that three million people went through something and those three million people happen to be the ancestors of the whole Jewish community. You can't convince the whole Jewish world that their grandparents witnessed something and we'll all believe it if our grandparents are telling us it never happened. Think about other religions. What does Christianity claim? Christianity claims that Paul was walking on the road from Damascus, and at some moment he has an, a, a, a meeting with JC, he has his own revelation, and then he goes and shares it and creates Christianity. Saul, Paul, whatever. Now, Islam claims that Muhammad was taught by a certain prophet for 22 years. I believe it was the prophet Gabriel. Gabriel. Buddha claims that one person had an experience, he had an epiphany when he was sitting under a tree. Every other religion claims that their beginning traces itself back to one, maybe two people. None of the major religions trace the two. There might be some tiny little religions out there that trace themselves back to one, more than one. But on the most part, every major faith, not even not even faith that's monotheistic, not even faith that believes in God. Every single culture that changed the world through a, through a perspective traces itself back to one man, usually it's a man, one man's perspective. The genius of that is you can never disprove it. How can you disprove that Paul didn't see JC on the road? You can't. How do you disprove that Muhammad wasn't taught by the angel Gabriel? You can't. How can you prove that Buddha did not reach enlightenment when he was sitting under the tree? You can't. And because you can't, that's why it has such strength. That's the tradition. It happened. What are you going to argue? You could scream till you're blue in the face. That's what happened. But Judaism came up with the most ridiculous idea, if it's made up. They don't claim that one man climbed the mountain. They claim that two to three million people, men, women, and children, stood at the foot of the mountain and God revealed himself and said, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am God, your God. Why in the world would we concoct such a story? But more importantly, how can you concoct such a story? Imagine I sit around with you around the table and I, we have right now 43 families sitting around watching. Imagine I talk to you right now and I convince you that Madagascar just went up in smoke. I don't know, the most random thing. And I convince you that, no, that we all just witnessed a nuke taking place. Now, 
chances are 99.9%, .9 I would like to believe 100% of you are not that gullible. And you would all think to yourself, the rabbi's lost his marbles. But even if you decide for the sake of it to play along with me, we, when we were watching a shear, we just had this massive boom and we heard a new. How long could that myth last? How long till it takes one person, if not all 43, to walk out and sit there saying, guys, like, actually, this didn't happen. Between me and you, it never happened. How long does a secret stay a secret? Never. How could you create a secret that your father and my father and my mother and your mother all say the same story going 3,331 years, 3,332 years, sorry, this year is 3332 from the time of the giving of the Torah. Next year will be 3333. 3332 years ago, we claim that we all, all our ancestors stood there. And not once in history, till 150 years ago, did anybody within the religious community ever doubt that experience. Why? Because the greatest factual proof is not archaeologists archaeologists digging in the ground, it's when you have the whole world saying the same narrative and nobody putting doubt into it because you, everyone has the same tradition, that is the greatest proof. The greatest proof is not that I'm talking to you tonight. It's that all of you were told by your parents, who were told by their parents, who were told by their parents, going back and we could trace many of our lineages all the way straight back to the time in the desert. There are many Jews today from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Yehuda, or Levim, Levim and Kohanim, that literally can trace themselves back. If you're a Levi or a Kohen, or you come from a family of Levim and Kohanim, it's not so hard to trace yourself back, straight back to Aaron, the first Kohen, or to Levi, the first Levi. So that means you could trace yourself back 3,000 years. And during those 3,000 years, every single one of your ancestors told you that you're a lady or you're a con. And your ancestors 2,000 years ago were serving in the temple, as in 3,000 years ago, as in 3,332 years ago when the temple was built. So the greatest proof that Judaism is valid is because we're here still telling that story, as is the story of the Exodus. Will they ever find wheels on the bottom of the ocean from the Egyptians that, that drowned in the Nile, in the Red Sea, I don't know. But what I do know is that I can trace back Pesach Seders for 3,000 years. So you tell me when that story was invented. We have documents in the book of Joshua, which was written by Joshua, right when he comes into Israel, we have documented the story of the Jews keep the Pesach Seder. That means the beauty of Judaism is we actually have books that trace back the story of Judaism, books that were authored in real time, all the way back to Sinai. So this hypothesis that people come and argue and say at some stage the Sinai story was invented, my argument to them is prove it. Find me a time in history when the rabbis were so convincing that they managed to convince the people that the story of Sinai happened and the whole people bought into it and it lasted for 3,000 years. How in the world is that possible? Because now I'm gonna tell you what we claim about Sinai and how ridiculous it is, not ridiculous, unimaginable. In other words, counterintuitive. It, it's, it's so hard to get your head around that we made the story up. We say like this, that on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, 49 days after the Jewish people left Egypt, 50 days, um, they counted 49 days, and the 50th day, the Jews surrounded a mountain. They stood about a few hundred meters around the, from around the mountain. There was a gate nobody was able to cross. Moshe, Aaron, and some of the elders climbed the mountain. And suddenly, the cloud of glory comes down on the mountain, and God booms with, through his voice, Anoichi Hashem Elekech. I am the God, your God. Thou shall be no other God, etc. That is more impossible in theory to convince somebody to happen than to tell you a nuke just went off. Well, 
because since then, and never till then, did God ever reveal himself. We have no documented history in Jewish history and in any other history that God did what we call mass revelation at any other time. So this event was so unusual, more unusual than me telling you a new quino. And yet, everyone bought into it for thousands of years. How? Why? Why would anyone buy into it? And why, if the rabbis were trying to convince a group of people that a story made up, why tell them that three million people stood at the mountain? You should have said one person stood. It's so much more sellable. Why create a story that is so easy to disprove? Because they didn't create the story. And therefore, it's never been disproved. As I said earlier, even the biggest doubters of Jewish history, the people who caused the most havoc in Jewish history never doubted this experience. What happened was in the 19th century, a thing developed called biblical criticism, where they developed the whole philosophy, a bunch of uh, scientists and thinkers in Berlin, were all mostly German, they start convincing themselves that the Torah was written by a bunch of writers because they find, they claim different patterns of writing, even though that since then there have been many tests even done by computers to see what the chances are that the Torah has the same writer based on style. And there's a, that it's almost, I believe it's 90%. In other words, their arguments weren't valid, but they, they came across very intellectual that the Torah was invented. Now, why am I spending your time and my time trying to convince you Sinai happened. Why are we talking about this? Because as I said, Sinai is the most important event in Jewish history. And now I'm gonna tell you why. Why is it the most important event of Jewish history? Because it's at that moment that we became a nation. Until then, we were a race. Jews used to be a race. What do I mean we were a race? We all came from the same family. We all had the same look. By the way, it wasn't anything like this. It wasn't pale. And uh, there was no blue eyes. It was very Semitic in its look, very Arab looking. We are, at least race-wise, we are Arabs. That's why Sephardi Jews look Ar Arabic. They actually have the genuine Jewish look more than Ashkenazi Jews. And that's a whole share for another time. And I can't even, I'm not sure I'm ready to give that share about the history of Ashkenazi Jewry because there's more questions than answers how exactly we became light skin and blonde or red hair or like anything else other than the typical Arabic look. So we were a race. If you would see the family of Jacob and his kids and their, their wives and their children, you would see a bunch of people literally living in the Middle East right now. And if anyone wanted to join, you weren't able to join. How could you join the Jewish people? You were either born into the family in the club or not, came Sinai and said, no longer are you a race, no longer are you a family, you are a nation. But no longer are you a nation that's dependent on where you live or what you claim you are. From this moment, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. At that moment, Judaism, like I spoke last year, and Jewishness became two things. In other words, at that moment, if you're a Jew, whether born into it or converted in halacha, you are now a Jew, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your, your race, no matter your gender, no matter your family, no matter your, your lineage. So much so that in the Talmud, some of the greatest sages, including Rabbi Meir and others, are attributed to be grandchildren of Haman from the Purim story. That's how open-minded we are to accept anybody to convert. Rabbi Akiva, the greatest of sages, was a convert, etc. Why? Because now Judaism doesn't belong to anyone, and yet once you have it, you can't get rid of it. It's not a family thing anybody could join. There's no such a thing as a Jewish race because anybody could become Jewish, in theory. But once you're in, you're stuck. You could jump up and down. You could claim that you became a Christian. Heaven forbid. You could claim that you did anything in life, that, that Judaism means nothing to you. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. 
And if you're if the, the Jew passes away, we'll bury them in Jews. Something obviously, if they they don't want it. But the point is, we're never going to say no. Why? Because a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. What does that mean? A Christian is not a Christian as a Christian as a Christian. That's ridiculous. If you stop believing in JC and the fundamentals of Christianity, you're not a Christian. In Islam, if you stop believing in the fundamentals of Muhammad, you're not a Muslim. Muslim is, 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 is a religion. It's something you either buy into or you buy out. Judaism, you could scream from today to tomorrow, you're the biggest atheist on the planet, and you could be the biggest atheist on the planet, and you're still Jewish. And if, you, if you're the 10th person, we'll still make you a minion. I'll arrive one day. A minion. That's an incredible concept. So what happened on Sinai that suddenly a group of people that till then were a family, quite a dysfunctional family, let's be honest, um, Joseph's brother sold them as a slave. Then they spent hundreds of years in Egypt and they, they were slaves. It, was a, it wasn't exactly the most uh, hecha fenster group of people you've ever seen on the planet by the time they made it out of Egypt. They were quite a, a shabby sight. God takes them, puts them around the mountain, and from them says, And from this moment you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Done. And from this moment, you're in a covenant with me. And the word covenant is big because it's a, it's a covenant. In other words, it's a relationship. It's a promise. It's a partnership. You're in a covenant with me through thick, through thin. And boy, have, you, have we been for 3,000 years through thick and through thin. So if you accept Sinai experience, you accept the story of Judaism and Jewishness. If you don't accept it, then you struggle with the story. What actually is Judaism? Is it just another group of people who may be a little older than Christianity and Islam, who at some stage decided to make up their own religion? Somehow it never became popular. I mean, Christianity has over a billion people. Islam has over a billion people. Us, Nebuchadnezzar, we have 15 million, and 80% of us don't even believe in what we're supposed to believe in. So we're doing fantastically well, right? Um, what, so what actually happened to this Jewish story? When, what, how, how, how did you become Jewish? Why is it so important to you to get buried in the Jewish cemetery? Why was it so important to you that the rabbi that marries you, a, a rabbi should marry? Why is it so important that your son had a bris? Why? Because somehow, even if you can't articulate it, even if you claim to maybe do it because it's nice tradition and I come from a nice place, ultimately there's this voice inside of you that knows that you're a Jew. It can't articulate it necessarily. It not necessarily has the right words, but it, just, it knows it. And because it knows it, it makes big decisions accordingly. 98% of Jews around the world, 99% of Jews, give their kids a circumcision. Almost everyone has a Pesach Seder. I'm not saying everyone believes in God. Most of the, many people who have Pesach Seders don't believe in God, but they do it. And the Pesach Seder is claiming that 3,000 years ago, we sat around the same table 50 days before we received the Torah at Sinai. So even though Shavuot is not necessarily the most popular Chag in the Jewish calendar, the average Jew knows about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Passover, a little bit maybe about Sukkot, but Shavuot is really not popular. Only thing people know maybe is that you eat dairy on that day. But Shavuot, which is coming up next week, Thursday night, is the day that we commemorate 3,000 years ago, that God turned us into a nation. It's the single biggest event that affects your life. It's the single biggest effect, event that's affected your history. Whether it is the tragedies of your history, the Holocaust persecution, whether it is the genius of history, the Jews that have risen, uh, created such a difference in the world, all of that traces itself back to one moment when we became the Jews. Till then, we were the Hebrews. We weren't Jews. When we were slaves in Egypt, we were the Hebrews, Ivri. Yehudi, Jew, we became when we stood around the mountain and we made a marriage with God. God came down for the only time in history, so much so we're told that even when Mashiach comes, there's never going to be a revelation like Sinai again. It was a once-off, never-to-be-repeated moment when God revealed himself in such a powerful way that created an everlasting bond that even though he's never revealed himself since and will never reveal himself the same way again, its impact has lasted generations.
So try to imagine you and your story and the decisions you made in your life as long as you've been alive without that event. Without a question to each of you, regardless of how observant you consider yourself to be, it is the single most pivotal event in your life because it's, it's affected the person you chose to marry, the way you chose to raise your children, the way you chose to circumcise, the way you're going to choose to be buried, the way you said Kaddish for your parent. All of that is based on the fact that you became a Jew, that you're a Jew. And that's what we celebrate on Shavuot. We celebrate the fact that you became a Jew and that Judaism no longer belongs to a family or a race, but rather belongs to each and every one of us. I'll give you an example of what I'm saying. You know, Abraham had two children, Yitzchak and Yishmael. Yishmael went off the derech, as they say it in modern lingo, OTD, off the derech. Is it Yishmael Jewish? No. Yitzchak had two sons, Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esau. Esau, Esau went off the path. Is he Jewish? He's actually the father of Rome the ancestor of Rome. And yet today, and for the past thousands of years, any Jew that leaves is still part of Judaism. What changed? Why is it that the founders of the faith, their own children are not considered Jewish or Hebrews? And today, any time they can Harry is Jewish if they're Jewish. What happened? Exactly, Sinai. Until Sinai, you were part of the family and you had to believe in what they believed in. If you decided to leave the family or you decided to leave, stop believing what they believed in, you were out. You could be the son of the founder of monotheism. I mean, think of who Yishmael was. He's the son, the older son of Avram, considered by all the father of all monotheistic religions. His own kid is lost to history, lost to Judaism, lost to the Jewish family, as is Yitzchak. Because Judaism wasn't something that you were, it's something you decided to adopt. If you were part of the family and you decided to believe in certain things, then great. If not, zeitgezunt. Today, no zeitgezunt. We're gonna chase you around the world to get you to put on tefillin, get you to say Shema, get you to do anything. Why? Because you can't leave. You're stuck. Because Sinai happened. And at that moment, you are part of something that you are in a covenant and you cannot leave this covenant. You could scream high water, but you can't leave it. How does that make you feel? Huh? You can't leave it. And that's the gift and the challenge of Judaism. The gift is that we have free choice and at the same time we don't. You have free choice and ultimately you decide if you're gonna to come to the shir today or not. Nobody told you to. And you decide if you're gonna stay on, are you gonna listen or are you gonna leave? But you didn't decide what you were born into and you didn't decide to be a Jew. A few weeks ago was Yom HaShoah and I was reading again the, my grandfather's story. I shared it on the radio. So my, my, my great grandfather, my mother's father's father and and great grandmother, his wife, and their kids, besides my grandfather, they were all shot in one pit in uh, Ukraine by the Einsatzgruppen. That was the group of the Nazis that would come into each city, take the Jews out to nearby forest and kill them. So the, the, this town had 850 Jews, including Jews who had converted to Christianity a few years before. And they were shot in the same pit. Why? Because the Nazis didn't buy it. A Jew is a Jew. They didn't buy it. And as Chief Rabbi Sachs says, if the Nazis had hunted down every Jew in hate, it's our job to hunt down every Jew in love. Reminds me of a good joke. I think it's, you know, it's been a heavy share. Let me share a, a, a bit of a lighter story. Stories told about uh, Yankel, the only Jew in town, and the local priest decides he's going to make Yankel's life an absolute misery. So he convinces the local uh, mayor to make a new policy 
that you can't eat fish on Friday night. What's a Jew without gefilte fish? Disaster. So that Friday night, the priest is walking by the Yiddelah's house, walks by, and he looks through the window, and what does he see? Yankel is eating fish. Knocks on the door, barges on the door, and says, Yankel, do you know that the death penalty is coming on you? He says, what did I do wrong? He says, you're eating fish. He says, no, it's not fish. He says, what are you talking about? That's fish. Yankel says, no. He says, he tastes it. He says, it's fish. Yankel says, you know what? Ten minutes ago, I took a few drops of water. I sprayed it on this piece, and I said, you're a chicken, you're a chicken, you're a chicken. What's the point of the story? The point of the story is like, you can spray water from, from today to tomorrow. You're still a Jew. And that's an absurd concept that some Jews cannot stand. And, and that's why you have this unbelievable phenomenon of self-hating Jews around the world. Thank God in South Africa, it's not a thing on the most part. But you have people that like, they, they can't stand the fact they were born Jewish, but there's nothing you can do about it. You can't un-Jewishize yourself. You can un-Christianize yourself, it's very easy. I'm an atheist. I converted to Islam. You can't un-Jewishize yourself. That's such a weird concept that even the non-Jews know. So much so that Hitler used to say that the Jews who are making believe that they're Germans in a way are a bigger risk than the Jews who are sh sh um, showing up as Jews because the Jews dressing up as Germans are the ones trying to infiltrate our society and bring Judaism into us. Now these poor Jews, Jews who were infiltrating into Germany didn't consider themselves Jews. They considered themselves German, Germans. They considered Berlin to be the new Jerusalem. And yet you could scream and shout the Nazis saw them as Jews. On the contrary, they saw them in a way a bigger threat. The best moment of your history and the worst moment of history was silent. It, it allowed you to become part of the most beautiful piece of history. It allowed you to become part of a nation that would change the world on so many levels, but it also locked you into a relationship that you're never gonna get out. And I've seen it. I've been a rabbi here, but before that I did outreach around the world. I remember standing one time on the streets of Manhattan with a lulav and etrog on the day, on the holiday of Sukkot. And I, I asked a woman if she's Jewish. That's typical Chabad training. And she looks at me and says, no. I said, okay, fine. thank you so much, have a great day. She says, but interesting, my great-great-grandmother was Jewish. Her great-great-grandmother. Okay, I said, what are the odds? I said, which great-great-grandmother? My mother's, 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 mother. I'm like, you know that makes you Jewish. She's like, no, 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 no. My great-great-grandmother was Jewish. I'm like, it just, sorry. If, if, if it's true what you just told me, that's your mother's, 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 mother. At that moment, she discovers she's Jewish. I don't know what she did, but at that moment, she took the lulav and esrog with me and shirked. You could be lost for five generations. And in one moment, you could transform your life. There are people in our community who grew up without any Judaism, and at some stage, they just realized, I'm a Jew, I have to find out more. I'll show up to show. I'll join a community. I'll send my kids to Jewish school. Where does that come from? Reawakening, reawakening, everybody reawakening, people joining, being part of community. That comes from your neshama. What's your neshama? In, in, in language that you could understand, because neshama is a very intangible word. Soul, what does soul mean? Neshama is your covenant. It's the moment that you and God locked yourselves into a relationship that no matter how much you'll disappoint each other and no matter how many moments you'll want to kill each other, you're still stuck. It's a marriage that cannot be broken. There's no divorce option. Parent, child, siblings, it's the kind of relationship you can't break. You're stuck. And because you're stuck, Therefore, you have this part of you that is fundamentally in the relationship, even though you claim you aren't. Because that's the, it's in you. You're, you're in a covenant. Even if you don't know about your Judaism, even if you grow up without knowledge, even if you grow up with knowing so little, you're part of the covenant. You can't escape it. Not because someone's going to put a gun to your head, because it's you. Imagine I decided right now, 
to change, I'm human. I, mean, I can't say talking about changing gender because that is controversial and I'll leave it. But for thousands of years, it was accepted that your gender is who you are. Today, it isn't necessary. But the fact that I'm human, not an animal is accepted, right? I can't decide tomorrow I'm becoming an animal. I can't change it. I can't change my basic humanity. Even if you have these terrible stories about children who grew up in the fields and they ended up acting like animals and they have to be released back into the wild, they're still humans, even if they act like animals. A human being is a human being. You can't dehumanize a human being. You can't take the human out of human being, no matter how disastrous they are. So too, a Jew is as much your identity as your humanity. It cannot be taken out. You could jump, you could scream, I'm not human, I'm not Jewish, and you can mean it with all your heart. But unfortunately, it doesn't make a difference, and nobody buys it, not even the anti-Semites. And this, hopefully, what we did today explored, what I hope it showed you is, because ultimately, my catch in was to talk about Sinai. And yes, we offered various proofs that Sinai happened. But for me, the biggest difference I want to make in your mind is not that Sinai happened, but the consequences of Sinai's happening. In other words, the fact that Sinai happened has a huge ramification on your life. This Chag, whether you decide to celebrate it or not, whether you eat choose cheesecake or not, whether you decide to pray or not, it's irrelevant. This Chag, more than any other day in history, has altered your life in so many ways, it's unimaginable. The most un-Jewish Jew, in other words, the Jew that identifies the least with their Judaism, their life has been affected by this day. Because yes, it's the day that God gave us the Torah. That's a secondary fact. Yes, it's the day that we all witnessed the big revelation. That's the truth. But the biggest thing that happened then, the covenant. God showed up and married the Jewish people, and the Jewish people accepted it back. The movie, The Ten Commandments, doesn't get it right. It's not as if Moshe climbed a mountain and spoke to God and brought it down. That happened later. But the actual Ten Commandments, God boomed them out, everybody heard them, and then Moshe went up the mountain and spoke to God. Why? Because God wanted at least one moment in history to be seen by every Jew alive so that they could tell their grandchildren, every Jew that will ever be born, that once upon a time, the Jews traveled in the desert. I can't tell you where in the desert, and I can't even point where we traveled, but this is the story that we're going to say for 3,332 years, generation after generation, where we have it documented in each generation, that we stood on a mountain, and we told God, I love you, and he told us back, I love you back, and we decided to stay. And yes, together we've been through the Crusades, the Romans, the Greeks, the, the Sp Spanish, the Holocaust, the communists, and everything in between. This relationship has been battered and beaten more than any other relationship in history. Boy, have what we've been through. And we're still here, and we still care to know about the story. The mere fact, even if I didn't convince you anything tonight, the mere fact that you came to show up, is the biggest testament of what this day means to each and every one of us. The fact that you want to know more about your heritage, the fact that we're having a discussion about where we come from and why we're here, is the biggest proof that something happened on that moment. Because all of us come from very different stock. I'm born in Russia, Ukraine, that's my stock. Most of you come from Lithuania, some of you come from Poland, and some of you don't even come from Jewish ancestors. But you all showed up here tonight because you're part of a story. You're part of a covenant. And that beautiful covenant that we are all part of is what we're going to celebrate on Shavuot. Now this year, unfortunately, it seems we're not going to be in Shul together. And it's one of the most beautiful Chags every single year when we come together. And I'll be honest, my heart's broken. We already missed Pesach in Shul, and now we have to miss Shavuot as well. But I encourage you over the next 10 days till Thursday night next week, Learn a little bit about it, Google it, read about it, the Sinai story, the experience, and what it means to be a Jew. From this perspective, the following perspective, it is who you are. It's who you are. As a rabbi, it's not my job to convince you you're a Jew. It's ridiculous. How can I convince you? 
It's not my job to tell you to be a better Jew because you can't be a better Jew. You're already as good as you can be. In other words, you're a good person. The only thing I could tell you is just be true to who you are. Let's be true to ourselves. Because as much as we deny it, that day, that moment, we developed a relationship with God and we developed a relationship with each other. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazem. We are all each other's guarantors. Ever since that day, not only did we develop a relationship between us and God, we developed a relationship with each other. We're all responsible for one another. And that's why each and every one of you does so much chesed. Each and every one of you cares when you hear about another Jew who's suffering and you make a difference in their lives, whether financially or any other way you can. Because in that moment, the whole Jewish people, not just me as an individual, and God, all of us developed a multifaceted relationship that has lasted longer than any other relationship in history and is here tonight alive and poignant. And I want to thank you. I have to say that 